really glad that the topic which I have is a post-pandemic world. And here's what I have to say about it. So, you know, just to give all of you some perspective, we are in the 16th month of the pandemic. Just take a moment and let that sink in. My topic is publishing industry in 2030, which means a decade after today. I would like to actually divide the men in our society into two factions. The first faction of men are those who understand the true um, essence of feminism. It's a massive scale of human loss and pain. And um, if any of you have personally been in a really bad place, I would like to just let you know that, you know, it's really unfair. Whatever has happened to you is really unfair. It should never have happened. But if you are still here and if you're still pulling through, then that is incredible and that shows human tenacity. And in the post-pandemic world, that is what is going to come through. We're going to realize what human tenacity and the human mind can do. We're going to realize the value of education because even the students who would love to not go to school or college are tired of being at home and even they are desperate to go back and somehow just connect with the world. We will realize the value of our neighbors who we take for granted, but they were the ones who were there when our very own family members couldn't be with us because they were in a different part of the world. My father is posted in Africa and I haven't seen him in so long because of the pandemic and it's, it's really sad and this has been happening. But I have neighbors, I have friends who I don't speak to the whole year, but they were the ones who were my support system during the pandemic. So I think in a post-pandemic world, it's not going to be about zombies and an apocalypse. We are in the middle of an apocalypse right now, but the zombies which will come out will be the people who were indifferent during this apocalypse and even now they continue to be indifferent. The zombies will be human beings, the ones who sit on their high horse because they're privileged and they don't need to feel the pain and the humanness of just being human. So in a post-apocalyptic, post-pandemic world, I think we will learn to value things so much more than we ever have. Thank social anxiety is something we make light of it. We have means which help us tackle social anxiety, quote unquote, tackle it. But that is not the answer. I think during the pandemic, we really realized even if you are an introvert, even if you don't talk to people, I think during the pandemic, you have realized that you need human connection. You don't need 10 friends, but you need that one person who you can talk to. Now, you don't need to go out and just prove your existence. You don't need to have a loud existence and just, you know, grab attention. But you need to be somebody who has an existence, which is which is something that human beings in general lack. Because they're trying to grab so many things, they miss out on the small things, which is what actually makes things big, if you know what I mean. So I think in terms of social anxiety, you can make connections over social media, which is something we have learned during the pandemic. Even though it's not something which I would personally want. I love meeting people in person. I'm just curious, how do you think or what steps do you think should be taken to help them out? Like we as in person, like you and me, we are well settled. We have enough things to get handy. But what about those people? How do you, uh, how do you think we should help those people? Like I'm just curious. Bro. Thank you for the question. That's a very important question to ask. Again, when the pandemic began, we saw this really heartbreaking event where migrant workers were, I mean, they were walking home because the government couldn't provide chains for them. And we know what happened. If you've been following the news, you saw what happened. So the thing here is, at this stage, I don't want to call out anybody, but I think there are, uh, there are certain established institutions by the state, but those institutions, for some reason or the other, do not function the way they need to. So it is individuals, it is NGOs, it is all these really small, really insignificant people who come together and they are the ones who make a difference. They realize what feminism is actually for. They have their own basic ideologies, their own principles, but they also understand what, why do we need feminism in the world today. They support it, they may not support it, but they are calm, they are composed and they move ahead with their lives. The second faction are those who actually retaliate when they hear feminism. That's because they feel that feminism is about being suppressed uh, under women. It's about uh, degrading men. It's about hatred towards men. It's about threatening men and all of those negative thoughts, which is absolutely not true. 
and i wouldn't really blame them for this thought because it all roots back down to the golden ages wherein you know patriarchy was very common do you think that men have also been pressurized in their own respective fields in similar but different ways and what are they okay so um i would like to cite an example here for this amazing question so uh, you know when we talk about rape culture in our society it, the first thing that comes into our minds is rape of women but we often the one thing that goes unnoticed is that rape is also prevalent in the society with men and i i rarely find uh, you know any importance given to such cases or such kind of uh, conflicts which occur within men and that i think is itself an explanation of the fact that men are suppressed to a certain extent so that's how i would like to term the fact that yes definitely uh, men are suppressed and they face pressure in a few such examples and situations in life the people like uh, feel there, there are people who feel like feminism is all about hating men so what do uh, what do you think the the steps should be taken that you know could go against or could actually tell the people what exactly feminism means okay so i think one way we can do this is by creating awareness but just creating awareness or conducting workshops won't really um you know solve the problem so i think representing male problems or the problems and issues faced by men at uh, you know the same part of that of how we are representing women's problems would also be a good solution and even if women take up the initiative to uh, you know represent men at different levels of the society that would again be i think a great booster to the question of the problem you right uh, rose right now I think uh, a lot can happen in a decade and I think the transformation in the publishing industry will be anything but monotonous. I think it will be multifaceted and the catalyst for the change will be a technology and b our citizenship of this weird place called the internet. So I think firstly the production and the priority given to the audiobook industry will increase because people are realizing the absolutely beautiful idea of listening to an audiobook when you're doing mundane chores like washing dishes or doing your wardrobe or something like that and i think second change will be the publishing industry will become more accessible i think the publishing industry will open its doors and understand the impact of books that impact the books can have and thirdly i think marginalized voices such as the queer community or the women community or dalits will their voices will be highlighted and their life stories will come in the form of books by by the medium of publishing industry and on a lighter note i think uh, booktubers and bookstagrammers and book bloggers will become a huge part of the marketing of a book and data analysis and statistics will become a huge part of the marketing of a book too and i think no matter what the change is i want the industry would want well, i want the industry to turn into a powerhouse of sorts that not only celebrates but also advances the beauty and the magic of written word that's what i think thank you you uh, mentioned a lot of important changes that all of us can already envision taking place and uh, to that effect i would also like you to like to ask you after a decade uh, do you think hard copies of books paperbacks hard covers do you think they will still exist and if uh, not then do you think people will just as enthusiastically you know download ebooks uh, on their ipads if all of us possess them one day I think as long as I live I will make sure that the hard copies of books are present in the world there is nothing like tilting a page and reading the next page I think there are many people who prefer reading books because you know ebooks can get a little hard on our eyes so in those aspects there are definitely people who prefer both things I think we have to go in a way where we can develop both the things as a medium of storytelling the copies of books are made open access so anybody on the internet will be able to view the contents of the books so uh, without paying a fee for it so it will be essentially be able to be downloadable by all so my question would be what is your uh, take or how do you envision this evolving in the future 
because it's already being taken up extensively by publishing industries right now yes but uh, i think it's it's a great uh, initiative because people have access to so many books but it should also be compensated to the authors and the people who put so much effort into the books making it completely free would not make a lot of sense in a way where everybody can be benefited but i think selectively to uh, make the books available to people who really cannot afford them instead of everybody that will be a very sensible way to go